Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Positively Track. I am just one of your hosts, Bruce Gibson, and with me, as he always is, is Dan Gunther. Dan, how are you? Bruce, I'm doing well. Excited to uh, get behind the microphone with you again here. Uh, it feels like we've, we've had a little bit of a, a break there. We had a, a little hiatus, our first couple of missed weeks since we started the podcast back in 2020, but uh, good to be back in the saddle. All the other metaphors I can think of for uh, being on this podcast with you. Yeah, because, you know, we haven't done it in a while. So in the introduction, I always try to do something a little different, but I just did the standard, you know, welcome and here I am and with me always, Dan, <laughs> it's the typical podcast introduction type of thing. You can't beat a classic. I mean, you know, you try to introduce new Coke, the public hates it. So you go with Coke classic. You got to stick with the classics. I like it. I will have to admit though, I did enjoy new Coke when it came out. Oh really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right on. Yep. And then they rebranded it Coke two for a while. And mm. uh, when they brought the classic back and every once in a while I would buy the Coke too. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was one of the few <laughs> that was okay with it. But anyway, I still enjoy the classic taste of Coca-Cola and I also drink Pepsi, even though I live in Atlanta and it's like taboo to drink Pepsi in Atlanta um, <laughs> because this is the headquarters of Coke here. So, but I, I, I do both. So careful, yeah. make sure your neighbors don't find out. It's weird because it's times I go to the grocery store and I'll buy Pepsi sometimes because it's on sale. And I'm like, oh, well, I'll get that. And I'm like, I, I feel guilty. Like, Going to check out is like, are people judging me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they sell it there, right? So it, it can't yeah. be just you. Need like a Pepsi lover support group in Atlanta or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I had COVID, gosh, what was that? Back uh, end of June. And I pretty much have recovered, but I still, every, every once in a while, I still have the cough or something. It's just, it, it, it can linger for a while. So. Oh, brutal. Yeah, that's not fun. I, I've been lucky still so far, so I don't envy you. <laughs> well, it's funny how many people come out of the woodwork when you mention you had COVID. Oh, yeah, I had COVID too. Oh, yeah, I had COVID. I'm like, I didn't know you people had it. Like, it's just like, every, it's almost like you joined a club. Hey, yeah, we're all COVID people. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. But anyway, we're not here to talk about that. You know, we're talking about a legend today and it's long overdue because we had the passing of Nichelle Nichols who played Uhura on the original series and she passed away on July 30th. So, you know, about a half month ago, it wasn't that big of a surprise to me because I knew her health was declining and also knew that, you know, they did that last hurrah convention for her mm -hmm. you know about a year ago or a little less than a year ago so but it's still sad and so we're going to talk about that in the feature but before we do that dan let me just ask you where were you when you found out about her passing i think i was at home here because yeah i, I remember oh no maybe i found out while i was on break at work because i i generally don't look at my phone while i'm working i, I don't really have an opportunity to uh, so I remember kind of going on to Twitter, whether that was at work on a break or after I got home and just kind of seeing like, wait, what's what's happened? A lot of people are, are posting about Nichelle Nichols. And before I'd actually seen that she'd passed away, of course, I, I kind of feared the worst there. And, and yeah, I, I just it slowly dawned on me as I was looking through these tweets and that that this had happened. So, yeah, it was uh, I. I definitely wasn't active online when the news first broke. I kind of saw the aftermath of it. I remember sitting, I think I was working at home and I sat down and just happened to get on my phone to do something or just take a break or something. And I remember seeing, I think maybe somebody posted something on Facebook and it was only just like a few minutes old. And all of a sudden I started looking and seeing it everywhere. And I was like, Oh wow. I need to tweet this out on the positively Trek handle. I it was like, cause like I rarely tweet from that handle. And I was like, Oh, the news is just broke. So, you know, I'm going to do this now, but, uh, or maybe it was on a Sunday. I just remember sitting in my room, like just chilling for a moment when mm -hmm. this, this happened. But anyway, we'll talk about some special memories that we have of her 
and her portrayal of Uhura on Star Trek, the original series and the animated series and the movies. We'll have that in the future. But, oh, and then also we have an announcement on the future of Positively Trek that we'll save to the end about some changes we're making to the show. So you're going to want to stick around for that because, you know, you want to be in the know, right? You don't want to be listening to Positively Trek and go, I don't know what's going on because I didn't listen to the whole episode. No, you got to <laughs> stay for that. So. Absolutely. There we go. We'll, we'll get our, our viewership numbers through the whole episode up now. You're on to our, our secrets here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So things always are changing. So we have some changes we want to share with you at the end of the episode. But before we do all of that, we're going to go into some news. And, you know, we have Star Trek Las Vegas. I know that's not the official name. It's now the 56-year mission convention in Las Vegas coming up at the end of this week as we're, uh, you're getting this episode as it drops. And, of course, we've got the big amount of... Star Trek celebrities, you know, a hundred, whatever. I don't know how many there are, but there's so many of them. It's always crazy. It's like, I've always been impressed with how they do that convention with how many of the Star Trek people that they get at this stuff. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. The people they get lined up. Now, I do have to say, I have been seeing posts on social media of news in the last few days of various people being unable to attend and dropping off. So that number's in a bit of flux, but it is still, yeah, impressive the huge number of Star Trek personalities they get to this convention. And uh, yeah, like you said, August 25th to 28th, so coming up later this week, coinciding with, of course, the return of Star Trek Lower Decks on August 25th. So that's kind of interesting that they're lining up that way. How odd. (laughs) <laughs> that is odd. I hadn't even put those two together. That's interesting. Yeah, but I'm looking at the trekmovie.com article that says that tickets almost sold out for the 56-year mission and does mention there's about 130 Star Trek celebrities. It's funny you said you're seeing some already drop because I noticed the other day at Dragon Con here in Atlanta that comes up uh, Labor Day weekend I counted 12 Star Trek celebrities in attendance. Oh, wow. Yeah, really good number. And my wife was like, wow, that's great. 12 of them. You'll have to try to see all 12 because I might go down for one day. I was like, yeah, well, it's 12 now, but it will drop. So Mm. some people will drop out (laughs) at some point. And William Shatner's one of them. And William Shatner's going to be in Las Vegas. The the guy's still making the Trek rounds. You know, It's, it's crazy. But Hey, it's almost sold out. So even if I wanted to go to Las Vegas, which I can't, I'm not going, I can't get like the big pass for the whole weekend. It's already sold out. Yeah. And I had seen a couple of weeks ago, the Saturday passes were completely sold out, which, you know, that's kind of considered the big day of the convention, right? So I, I've seen people posting on social media and my heart goes out to them. They're saying like, oh, I was waiting until payday to get my tickets and and now I see Saturday is sold out. Does anybody have any that they can sell and that sort of thing? So uh, it's, it's crunch time for Star Trek fans who want to make it and who haven't committed to a ticket because yeah, you're, you're going to have a tough time on some of those bigger days. And I hate the fact that it's not an official convention because I, I don't like that they can't say Star Trek in any of the promotions and things like that. But this year it's at Bally's hotel and casino there on the strip which is going to be different because it was always at the other place. Wait, what was that place called? Uh, the Rio. Yeah. The Rio. Yes. Which always disappointed me because I love Penn and Teller and they never would do a show hmm. <laughs> when the convention was going on. Cause yeah. I was like, I'll go see Penn and Teller while I'm at the convention and they take off for vacation or whatever. <laughs> they're doing. So, yeah, I still remember way back in the day when it was at the Las Vegas Hilton. That was, which I think is not even called that anymore. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah, I forget what it's called now, but yeah, it's not the Hilton anymore. I never was at that convention at that location. But yeah, when Star Trek experiences, I've been to Star Trek experience, but not during a convention. And man, mm. I would love to do that. Oh man, I missed, I made it the one time, probably about two months before they closed the Star Trek experience, we had to make a trip to go there and so glad I did. (laughs) That was so much fun. Well, the other thing that, you know, even though I'm not going to Vegas, this thing really sells me on it. So there's some special things going on. Like Mary Chifo is doing a yoga class, 
which I would not do because I'm so out of shape right now. I can't, <laughs> I can barely bend forward. So I, I would embarrass myself at that. And then they're doing a tribute to Ricardo Montalban, who played Khan. But then Tig Notaro is doing a stand up special. That's awesome. I would love to see that. <laughs> that would be like if I had known that, I'd been like, ooh, I've got to make this work just for that. But yeah. the timing isn't going to work for me anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah, I unfortunately can't make it this year either. We've had people asking if we will be attending on uh, the Positively Trek discussion group, which you can find on Facebook. We'll let you in if you just agree to the rules. <laughs> but uh, yeah, unfortunately, neither of us will be making it to the 56-year mission. Things are kind of looking pretty good for me for Mission Seattle in uh, May of next year, the the new official Star Trek convention from Reed Pop. I don't know how that's looking for you at this point, but I, I might be able to make that. I'm I'm optimistically hopeful about that one. I might be able to also. I haven't thought a whole lot about it yet. I haven't planned ahead, but it's interesting we're talking about that because a coworker of mine that left the company a little more than a year ago moved to Seattle to work for a company there. And we just had a zoom hangout yesterday. Haven't talked in a while. And I'm just like, man, I got to come visit you in Seattle, but I, you know, I got to find a reason to go to Seattle. Well, there it is. Right there, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I love Seattle. I've been there a few times. It, beautiful city, wonderful place. So uh, I'm eager to go just to go back to Seattle again. Yeah. And the weather might be nice at that time of year, the end of May. So that that's a good time. Looking forward to that. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> and maybe we'll host another book panel at oh, the official convention. That would be cool if I could actually be on for that one. That would be fun. Yes. Yes. We'll see how that goes. But, you know, speaking of books and speaking of products from Star Trek, you know, we've had a favorite guest on the show several times, Ben Robinson from Eagle Moss and the Hero Collection. And he's kind of in the Star Trek news right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Because <laughs> we talked about this on a previous episode that, you know, there's a, there's a problem with uh, Eagle Moss where it just had to file for administration or bankruptcy or whatever you call it there in the UK. And, you know, people worried like, oh, no, the company is shut down. And, and how am I going to finish my ship models? I need the other pieces. And what about the books that they do? And what about all the other items that they sell? Well, Ben Robinson was on the Weekly Trek podcast. They did a special interview. If you want to listen to it, it's number 189. So go check that out. I haven't listened to the episode yet, but I'm looking here on Trek Core, Dan. You posted this where they basically put the whole interview in text here. So you can read it too, if you don't want to listen to Ben's voice, but he has a very <laughs> soothing voice. He does. Yeah. I actually did listen to the episode. I am a regular listener of weekly Trek and yeah, they put out that, that special episode, like you said, episode 189. And basically Eagle Moss has been very quiet over the last few months about all of this. This was a big surprise to all of their customers and fans that this happened and Ben Robinson is now no longer an employee of Eagle Moss, which means he is able to kind of speak out about some of this stuff. So uh, it was, it's a really interesting interview. There's some hope for the future as well. So not all is lost. There's some things that like, you know, the, we have to be realistic about that maybe won't happen, but they're very optimistic about another company kind of coming along and picking up some of these licenses and continuing some of these projects. The big ones, of course, being the part work subscriptions that are in some state of completion, right? So all of the fans out there who are doing the build the enterprise D project. Now you've got like about two thirds of a starship now. <laughs> and with the future of Eagle Moss, uh, it, it's no longer going to come back as a company. He was pretty clear about that. That's a big question mark, right? But there's a lot of hope there that someone will uh, come in and take that over and produce the rest of that. So uh, it's really interesting interview. I definitely urge you to listen to that. And I'll of course have a link to that in the show notes as well for you to check out. Yeah. As I was reading the transcript to that interview, 
he kept emphasizing, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. Don't throw your models away that are half completed. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, you know, think that the parts aren't going to come. There's still hope, you know, just, just hold on, just hold on to your collection, hold on to things. They still may happen. Cause like you said, some other company is going to step in. Even in my job, I've dealt with some companies recently that filed for bankruptcy and somebody else came in within just, you know, months, just a few months or whatever, and take it over and they're up and running again. So, well, actually we just, now think about my company just purchased a company uh, that filed for bankruptcy and we rescued them and restarted things up again. So, I mean, that's pretty typical. So um, yeah, Eagle Moss, entered into administration in the UK, which is like bankruptcy here in the U S and so something more than likely will happen on the positive side and not everything will just go away. Mm -hmm. And that's not just us speaking as positively Trek. We've got to keep it positive. If you do listen to that interview, he is very hopeful about the future of this. And one of the things that, if you are a fan of these ships and want to see them continue, Ben Robinson right now on Twitter is releasing pictures of models that have been prototyped or in some stage of development, but not yet released. And he outright says in some of those tweets, you know, like these tweets, retweet them. It will show interest to potential people who might want to invest in keeping these going. So yeah, that's definitely something that if you are interested in seeing these continue, you can help out in that way as well. So you never know. Never give up hope. And just remember, Paramount has interest in this too, right? Yes, they're going to push for something to happen, some company to come in and keep this stuff going. Yeah, definitely. So, but yeah, I'm sure when all this was coming down, you know, Ben just heard, danger, Ben Robinson, danger, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, he's handling it well. I should, I should well. edit in a, a rim shot there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of Robinson, do you know who Andrew Robinson is? Of course. He's a, a simple tailor. Well, he played a simple tailor with not a, not a checkered past at all. You know, I've been slowly getting through my DS9 rewatch, and I just finished watching that two-part episode about Garrick in season three. Oh, Improbable Cause and the Die is Cast. Two of yes. my favorite episodes. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen those in so long. And I was like, oh, I forgot how good this is. You <laughs> blew up your own shop, Garrick. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so good. Oh, man. See, every time you talk about this, it makes me want to rewatch DS9 again. I know. I'm just, I'm just so glad I'm doing this. Because like I said before, I, the only time I've watched it from beginning to end was in its original airing. Ever since then, I just sporadically watch an episode here or there or whatever. And there's some episodes that I've watched where I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen this since the original airing. I barely even remember it. But like things start coming back to me. I'm like, I should have done this a long time ago. I can't wait to do the others like this. I haven't done like with Voyager or TNG in a while. I've seen TOS quite a bit, but yeah, like all of them. Like anyway, ah, so good. But you know, that's how it is like with the novels. Like you and I cover the novels we did on literary treks we've done on this show. And sometimes they're rereads for us. You know, it's books that we've read before. And Andrew Robinson had written the novel A Stitch in Time about Garrick after the Dominion War when Cardassia was attacked. And, you know, that's such a big popular novel. Well, he was on, not Garrick, Andrew was on uh, Sid City podcast with Alexander Siddig, who played Julian Bashir. And he kind of dropped a bomb on us here. Now, this isn't confirmed, and I'm reading this off of the redshirtsalwaysdie.com website. And they're saying that when he was on the podcast, he dropped the bomb that he's going to be recording the audiobook version of A Stitch in Time. That is so flipping exciting. I know, like, first of all, that novel, just the, the paperback version of it, is so hard to get your hands on at this point. And copy, copies of it are so expensive right now. Just the fact that it'll be more widely available in any form to anybody is huge news. But that Garrick himself is reading it is so... Like, I have this novel. I bought it when it first came out. 
I will definitely be picking this up and and listening to plain simple Garrick himself telling his story. That's so amazing. I will listen to it too. I've read the novel twice and I I would love to listen to Garrick reading the novel to me. Yeah, I mean it's like uh that's going to be so good. Now again, this isn't been officially announced by Simon Schuster or Paramount or anybody, but he's saying it's in the works and it's it's going to happen. So we'll keep an eye out for it. But yeah, it'll be in the notes if anybody wants to read that article. And it may even link you to the podcast if you want to listen to it. And oh, look, they embedded our podcast in the article too. That's nice of them. They're yeah. At, at Red Shirts Always Die. They they like our podcast, just so people know that, you know, that. Those people over there at Fan Sided love Positively Trek. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, yeah, to to scroll through the article and then see like, hey, that's our last episode. It's there. Oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yes. Well, let's go on with the rest of this episode. But before we do that, we're going to take a brief break just to pay the bills. And we'll see you here in a moment. This episode of Positively Trek is brought to you by our wonderful supporters on Patreon, including our Constitution class supporters, Jim Stoffel, Joyce Marin, Carl Morris, Dave Garcia, Rick Young, Paul D. Kinnear, Jesse Earl, and Justin Ozer. Thank you all so much for your support of Positively Trek. If you would like to become a patron of the show, go to patreon.com slash Positively Trek. You can get early access to episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, associate producer credits, and more. Once again, that's patreon.com slash positively trek. Thank you all once again. And now let's get back to the show. So let's go ahead and talk about Michelle. She was 89 years old, passed away July 30th of this year, 2022. She was born December 8th. I'm sorry, December 28th of 1932. Now, we all know the story of her being on Star Trek and talking to Martin Luther King Jr. before, you know, when she was considering leaving. And But, you know, there's still a lot of people that don't know how instrumental she was in bringing people into the NASA space program, people of color, uh, women into the space program. She had a huge influence there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, even taking just her role in Star Trek, like that was such a huge thing to see an officer, a woman of color on the bridge of the Enterprise. And and I mean, we as Star Trek fans have heard the story of Whoopi Goldberg, for example, seeing Uhura on the show and, and yelling to her mom, you know, mom, there's a black woman on television. She ain't no maid, right? That's That's the famous quote. And Uh, The inspiration that she had as Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek and to your point outside of Star Trek, you know, with NASA, like you said, and and just being that icon, that representative, such an amazing thing and such a bright star, a bright light in the whole Star Trek experience. You know, she's such a, a gem to have. In, as a part of this thing that we love and the loss is very keenly felt of course yeah it's just amazing when you think back to the 60s if you think back to that time and watching television you really didn't see a whole lot of black people i mean there was a lot of variety shows and people would come on and perform and you know i've heard the stories that even if they're a big star They had to come through the back door because they were black. They couldn't come in the way the white people could come in to the studios and such. And a lot of these shows, they portrayed, you know, maids or butlers or whatever, you know. But to have somebody there in a prominent role on the bridge of a starship and just, you know, you think about all the colors of the bridge and the colors of the uniforms. This is that time where television was moving into the age of color, color TVs, you know, NBC, which aired Star Trek was owned by RCA and RCA was trying to sell TVs and they wanted their shows to be colorful because they want people to buy color TVs. Well, you don't need a color TV to see it, but it's funny to think that this is the age of color. And this was also an age where color is being represented correctly in the black community 
on U.S. television at the time. And here she is, this African-American woman there on the bridge that isn't in a role of being a maid or anything like that. She's a prominent officer there, right there with Captain Kirk. Mm -hmm. And and a competent officer who, you know, maybe in retrospect, of course, didn't have as big a role in the show as maybe we would have liked or she should have. But like you said, was standing shoulder to shoulder with all of the other officers. She's a lieutenant. She's not, you know, subservient. She's a full member of the crew. And uh, just what that represents, I think we can, in a lot of cases, overlook that today or not really think about how much that would have meant at that time. But like, it's incredible. And we've talked about this before, but like, for example, the episode Balance of Terror, where the navigator has to leave the bridge and Uhura takes his place at the at the front, at the console there. And the camera kind of follows her as she sits down and lingers on her a little bit. And Sulu looks over with this kind of look of approval on his face or, or something like that. And you might not notice that shot today because it's just, you know, it's just Uhura. She's taking that station. But that would have meant so much that she is sitting at that prominent position up there. What that represented at the time, you you can understand why the camera wanted to focus on that and showcase that. Uh, you know, Star Trek, to borrow the words of other people, has always been woke. You know, at whatever that meant for the time period it was made in. And at that time, that's what that meant. And that was important to show. That was always one of my favorite moments of that episode. And one of my favorite moments for the character of Uhura, because not just because like you're saying the representation of this black woman in that role, but just the fact that she was always sitting there on the bridge behind Kirk hailing frequencies open captain, you know, and she would seem to have the same lines and, you know, doing that, but to actually see that character go, Oh yeah, I can work somewhere else. I can do other things. I'm just not, you know, working communications. I can work other places on this ship was like, that just said a lot to me. I was like, Oh wow. You know, she's an officer that has various abilities to do different things on the enterprise. Her, her role is communications, but she can do more than that. And I always liked that. It, that subtle scene says so much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agreed for sure. One of my favorites as well. So what are some of your other favorites, Dan? Because I have i didn't write my list down, but I, I know them off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, I, I, got a, I know a lot of them off the top of my head. I did jot some down, though, just to make sure I didn't forget some of my favorites, because there are ones that I definitely want to mention. Um, I'm going to start with the episode Charlie X and Nichelle Nichols. She's a wonderful, amazing actor, but she's also an incredible singer. And there's a few instances of her singing that get showcased in Star Trek. But my absolute favorite is in Charlie X when she's singing along to Mr. Spock playing on his uh, Vulcan harp. And she's kind of teasing him a little bit and saying, you know, who's this man in Satan's guise who will rip your heart in two and there's just this beautiful interplay between the two of them. I love that moment. And I think watching Star Trek for the first time, that was the moment I fell head over heels in love with Lieutenant Uhura. Oh, on the Starship Enterprise, there's someone who's in Satan's guise. Whose devil ears and devil eyes could rip your heart from you. Nice. That was a scene that was on my list for sure. There was a time in the early 90s where I recorded several episodes of Star Trek, the original series on my VHS tape. I didn't have all the series. It was just a select few episodes, just random. And that was one of them, Charlie X. And so I saw that episode over and over and over again, because when Star Trek wasn't on TV, I'd pop in that tape of the, these various episodes and yeah, her singing and, and I, and, and it wasn't so much that I liked seeing her character sing, but knowing that the actress was a singer and a performer, and it gave her the opportunity to show that talent on there through her character. 
and h- helped to also define the character was something that was was special. You know, I liked seeing that. So that that's a cool one for sure. So I'll, and because you mentioned that, another one on my list. It's not on the top of my list, but I got to throw it in there. Star Trek Five. Her dancing out there <laughs> in the desert. You know, with the palms and naked and stuff. I mean, it's and unfortunately, it's not Nichelle's voice. Yeah, they dubbed her with someone else. That's the that's the downfall of that scene. They should have kept her voice. I, I don't know why they didn't. I don't know the whole reasons, but but that's it, it's it's such a kind of cheesy scene in a way. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's fun. You know, it's it's fun to see her having a good time up there. And you know, what she say? I love playing to a captive audience. Hello, boys. I've always wanted to play to a captive audience. (laughs) Yeah. And just the way she said it, it was very Catwoman. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The only reason I didn't have that one on my list was, yeah, the, the unfortunate decision in my mind anyway, to not use her vocals and instead, use someone else's i again i don't know the reasons behind that there might i i don't know but uh yeah that's the only reason i didn't uh have that one immediately on my list (laughs) well speaking of the movies i will say one of my favorite horror moments is in star trek 6 when she's at near the end of the episode when they're trying to figure out how to find the klingon ship and she's like well the thing's got to have a tailpipe You know, that was like, you know, because typically in Star Trek, it would be Spock or McCoy or Kirk figuring that out, you know, like, oh, yeah. But it's like, yeah, thank you. Let your horror somebody else like come up with the with something that nobody else is thinking of. You know, I I just always like that for the final Star Trek movie with that cast. I'm glad that was in there. Well, what about all of that equipment we're carrying to catalog gaseous anomalies? The thing's got to have a tailpipe. I like that. Yeah, that's a good moment. I hadn't thought of that one, but that is a really great Uhura moment for sure. You know, the the moment she says, you know, what about all that equipment we're carrying for cataloging gaseous anomalies? And every head on the bridge turns towards her and she's like, duh, the thing's got to have a tailpipe, right? Like, this is great. What a great moment for sure. Well, I'm going to mention it's a, it's a small moment, but it's one of my absolute favorites from the episode, the naked time. And this is when Sulu bursts onto the bridge with a sword and he grabs Uhura. Sulu, give me that. Sulu. I'll protect you, fair maiden. Sorry, neither. She's neither fair nor a maiden. I love that so much. And I've recently read, I don't know. I haven't looked this up. I haven't researched it at all or anything, but I've read somewhere that that was ad libbed. I don't know that that's true or not, Oh, but if it is, it adds to my appreciation, appreciation of that line and Nichelle Nichols even more. Again, I can't confirm that at all, but I've just always loved that line. Like it's even just a little bit subversive for 1966 as well. You know, like I'll protect you fair maiden. Sorry, neither. I love that. It's so good. Uh, That is, I would say that would be maybe my favorite or second favorite line of Uhura's in the original series Mm -hmm. or, and, and the movies. Cause my favorite is Mr. Adventure in Star Trek (laughs) three. Yeah. Um, just, just to say here, I did put this one as my number one top. Okay. Yes. But but please go, go on because it's so good. Yeah. That's my number one too. It's because it's so great where she's like, welcome gentlemen to my parlor as you know, Kirk and gang come in and she's going to beam them up and she's working it. And this guy's like, you know, before they come in, he's just like, oh, you know, you're, doing this boring job and someone whose career is winding down and she just gives him a look like, okay, kid, (laughs) I've had enough of you. I'm going to take care of you. And when she pulls out her phaser and she's like, how's this for adventure? Huh? How's that blood boiling or whatever? She's like, puts him in the closet (laughs) and she's like, oh, I'll take care of him. Don't you worry about it. I have Mr. Adventure in my hand. It's like, that is such a great scene. You're going to sit in the closet. The closet? What have you lost all your sense of reality? This isn't reality. 
this is fantasy. You want an adventure? How's this? The old adrenaline going? Huh? Good boy. Don't get in the closet. Okay. Uh, Go uh, on. Go on. I'll just get in the closet. So good. It is so much fun. I, I, that whole sequence, that, that whole chapter basically on the DVD or Blu-ray stealing the enterprise is one of my favorite sequences in all of Star Trek. And that part of it is just it. I'm grinning from ear to ear every time I watch that scene. And I've seen it. I don't know how many times, but yeah, every little bit, you know, McCoy, I'm glad she's on our side, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like, well, where is a force to be reckoned with? And one of the things about Star Trek three, I always kind of found it a little bit sad that Uhura didn't get along, get to go along with them on this adventure, but she still has this really great moment to kind of kick things off. I just thought that was beautifully done. Yeah. Now uh, that's, that's the one downfall. Yeah. Cause she's not in that movie a whole lot. You know, she's kind of sidelined after that, you know, I always wanted to read a novel and maybe there is one out there of like what she, what was happening between then and, by the time she went to Vulcan and mm. and what she did on Vulcan and such. But I think I heard there was a scene in the script originally that was going to have a little more of her, but it was cut. I don't know. Yeah. I feel like I'd, I'd be interesting to know like how she got to Vulcan exactly. I was assumed she hitched a ride with Ambassador Sarek or something, but you know, like what was the pretense for her leaving her post and, and getting away to Vulcan. Meanwhile, her coworkers tied up in a closet. Like what happened when they found him? And, you know, ah, I don't know. There's so much there. It'd be really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Cause that, that guy's got to be thinking, why is a full commander running a transporter room? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, like I was talking about earlier doing the deep space nine rewatch. You know, I'm still at the part where Cisco is still a commander. He's not captain yet. And he's running the whole space station. Well, Yohor is the same rank. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to just work a transporter room. <laughs> and that guy's probably like, why is this commander doing? Yeah, I guess her career is winding down. You know. <laughs> oh, every time I just see that look that she she's looking down and she gives that look up at him like, oh, man. You were digging yourself a hole there, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and before I forget about it, it also reminds me of Star Trek Four. Where's Alameda? That whole scene with Chekhov <laughs> and stuff. I love that too. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody always focuses on the nuclear vessels part, but Uhura, I think, was fun in that scene as well. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I like that. Well, I, I I don't think any list would be complete. It. it gets a lot of attention but i think it's worth a mention the episode plato's stepchildren where it it's not as a lot of people say it's not the first interracial kiss on primetime television but it's one of the first for sure and it did cause a lot of quote controversy at the time with you know people being offended by this sort of thing but uhura and Kirk kissing in that episode, of course, was quite groundbreaking at the time. So it definitely warrants a mention here as an important Uhura moment for sure. You know, I, for some reason, I didn't even think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, because I just watched um, a documentary recently where they were talking about that. I don't know why that wasn't top of my mind, but yeah, I'm glad you, you called that out for sure. Cause you know, that's very well known even outside of, Star Trek. But I'll tell you one thing I'm going to mention. It's not really one of my favorite moments, but I have to throw it out there and it's not well known, but the Gamesters of Triskelin, hmm. that episode, that was one of the ones that was on my VHS tape. <laughs> that oh, yeah. I at least watched over and over again. And I never really cared for the episode, but I, I can't help but, you know, enjoy when she grabs her neck, when they all like grab their neck when the device like you know, starts to choke them and stuff like that. So it's very Star Trek, but I also want to say that I think it's important to point out that she didn't have a whole lot of lines in most of the original series episodes, but I'm glad they gave her more to do in the animated series. She did a lot more there than she did in the original series. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, one episode of the animated series in particular where she really gets to shine. And this is the part of the podcast where Aaron Harvey will sit up and take notice. 
<laughs> Shout out to our, our friend and uh, expert on the animated series. The Lorelei signal, of course, where Uhura takes command of the Enterprise in the face of all of the men folk aboard the ship being under the influence of this, uh, of what's going on in that episode. She steps up and takes command and, and saves the ship. Lieutenant Uhura to Security Officer Davison. Davison here. I want an all-woman security team on every transporter immediately. No one is to transport down to the planet unless it is on my order. Aye, aye, Lieutenant. What are you doing? Taking command of this ship. Great moment uh, being able to see Uhura in command in the animated series there. Big moment for her character. Absolutely. Yes, definitely wanted to get that one out there on the list. Um, But just again, working off the top of my head, the last one I think I can think of that I wanted to mention is Mirror Mirror. Ah. And especially the scene with Sulu on the bridge. On my list as well, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> when he's like coming on to her, she's coming to and then slaps him. It's like, oh yeah, you know, who's in control? <laughs> yeah. And and the fact that, of course, they're in this mirror universe and she's the the prime universe version of the character and she's just kind of trying to outwit them and, and escape with her life. Like that's so cool. I love that she takes charge of that moment and, and is so assertive and is able to con Sulu in this moment. It's so good. I was getting bored. Of course, this isn't the time. Any time's a good time. <sighs> I'm afraid I changed my mind again. You take a lot of chances, Lieutenant. So do you, mister. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, it's like she's very tough, but also very caring, you know? And yeah, the fact that Nichelle was very musical, I felt like came across in Uhura, even when she's not singing, you know? Just... She's a, she does come across to me as a musical character, which has been portrayed even in strange new worlds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in a lot of novels as well, too, they've kind of played with that aspect of her character for sure. Yes, absolutely. So I've got a couple more that I just want to throw out there. Uh, The episode who mourns for Adonis, where she is, uh, has her sleeves rolled up. She's under the console fixing something yeah, and, and Spock even makes the comment, I can think of no crew member more qualified than you to accomplish this or something like that. I'm connecting the bypass circuit now, sir. It should take another half hour. Speed is essential, Lieutenant. Mr. Spock, I haven't done anything like this in years. If it isn't done just right, I could blow the entire communication system. It's very delicate work, sir. I can think of no one better equipped to handle it, Miss Uhura. Please proceed. Just one of those rare moments we got to see Uhura doing something else and, and seeing her intelligence really showcased and, and put on full display rather than, you know, just sitting at the console and uttering the same lines, just giving her something different to do and showing that she's a competent officer. I love those moments. That's a good one. I, I'm glad you mentioned that one. Yes, I like that one, too. Uh, I also want to throw out uh, her meeting with Abraham Lincoln in The Savage Curtain. Just a a wonderful little moment there where Abraham Lincoln feels that he's slipped up in some of his word usage and and realizing that like, oh, you know, maybe I, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, forgive me, my dear. I know that in my time, some use that term as a description of poverty. But why should I object to that term, sir? You see, in our century, we've learned not to fear words. May I present our communications officer, Lieutenant Uhura? The foolishness of my century had me apologizing where no offense was given. It's just such a great moment, and I love that character in that moment there. But it just shows that time had moved forward, and these things weren't as much of an issue, so just weren't as sensitive to them. Yeah, yeah. And, and just, yeah, the growth of the human race in general 
you know, moving past. And and the symbolism, of course, that Lincoln has with history as well and and what he did. And, and that it's just a, a cool meeting between those two characters. I think that's a, a pivotal moment for sure. And so you haven't mentioned uh, her and Scotty in Star Trek V flirting with each other. No, I haven't. Um, that's a thing that happens. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have one other one that's kind of not really an Uhura moment, but a Nichelle Nichols moment. And we mentioned it, you mentioned it briefly at the top of the episode, but there was a moment early on in the production of Star Trek, the original series, where Nichelle Nichols felt that she wasn't really being fulfilled by the role of Uhura and was maybe wanting to move on to different things. And she tells this story of her encounter with Martin Luther King Jr. that convinced her to stay where he said, you know, you're such an important symbol. You know, what you represent on the bridge of the enterprise is so important. I would really encourage you to think twice about leaving this behind. And she tells that story to say that that's what convinced her to stay with Star Trek. And I think Star Trek as a whole is richer because of that decision and uh so that that encounter that she recounts so many years later so many more times meant so much to her and to star trek in general i just wanted to call that out it's not necessarily an uhura moment but just a great nichelle nicole's moment I, i'm glad you called it out because it and as you right i mentioned it earlier i i've heard that story so many times and it's so important but the one thing I don't want to miss in this that sometimes I think is overlooked is that she's also a woman, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at the original cast, it's mostly men. So she's also representing women at this time in the future. And we don't have a whole lot of them. Yeah, you see some in the background. And yeah, you have Chapel and Rand in there, you know. But Rand's only in like the first half of the first season. Chapel's here and there or whatever. But when you think of like the core seven, they're the Beatles of Star Trek. She's the only woman in there. So <laughs> yeah. she's representing not just African-Americans, but also women in this group and a strong woman that can keep up with the rest of the men. So I don't feel like that's often explored much uh, when talking about what she did for the show. That's true. And that's a very good point. Absolutely. She's really representative of... Yeah, like you say, women and black women as well. And and yeah, it, it's important to remember what she meant to people watching at the time. Both people who, who looked like her and people who didn't look like her, who maybe weren't used to seeing people that didn't look like them as, you know, heroes in their shows and stuff. So... I, I think that's that's important across the board. And, and I, I love that she fills that role in Star Trek and, and has done so for many decades. And now we have a series with a female black captain. I do want to tell one quick story. It's not about her on Star Trek. This is a, a Nichelle story that happened in 1994. And she had just released her novel Beyond Yohora. Is that the name? Yeah, it was yeah, Beyond it was, uh, her, her autobiography, yeah. Yes. So I, uh, a friend of mine called me one day, and he said, hey, you know, what are you doing tonight? I said, well, Michelle Nichols is in Atlanta at a, doing a book signing for her new book, and I'm just going to go to the bookstore and get, get the book and have her sign it for me. Now, he was not a big Star Trek fan. I mean, he was... You know, he kind of liked Star Trek, but his wife was a big fan. And he's just like, oh, and, you know, we're coming up on Christmas at this time. And he's like, oh, that would be great. Maybe maybe I'll come along with you and get her to sign the book for my wife so I can give it to her for Christmas. I was like, OK, we'll come along. So we got in line. It wasn't a real long, long line, but there was a good amount of people there. And we got up there and he went ahead of me and <laughs> he gets up there. 
And she's like, oh, hi, how are you? What's your name? And he says his name. He goes, but I want you to make the book out to my wife. And she goes, oh, well, what's your wife's name? And he tells her. And so she starts signing it. And he goes, man, you're really helping me out on this. He's like, this this is going to get me out in the doghouse with my wife. Because last year, all I got her were socks and a Winnie the Pooh keychain. And she stops signing midway and just looks at him. And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, I got in a lot of trouble last year because I just got her socks and a Wendy the Pooh keychain. And she's just staring at him. And then she looks at me and I'm like, I'm nodding my head and I'm like, it's true. <laughs> and she looks back at him and all of a sudden she drops the pen down, leans back and just busts out laughing. <laughs> just cracking up laughing at him. And she's like, oh my gosh. And then she finishes it with her hands on the book is still laughing as he walks off and she goes, Oh, I hope this helps, you know, whatever this, he goes, yeah, this is a better gift. I, I, I'm good. This is getting me out of the doghouse from last year. <laughs> and it, it, she's just, just laughing. And then I get up there and she just looks at me and she goes, so this is true. I'm like every bit of it's true. Yes. She goes, I, she's like, I just had to, like, he said that. And I was like, did I hear that right? Did he? <laughs> I'm like, you heard it right. It's pretty pathetic. And there's a lot more stories like that, but <laughs> she's like, she's just shaking her head. She's like, unbelievable. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> That's she's such, she was such a wonderful, warm woman. And I, my, my Nichelle Nichols story, I went to the, I think it was, yeah, the 2011 Star Trek Las Vegas convention. And I think that was, that was still at the Hilton at the time. And she was there and I had to get a photo op with her because it's Uhura, right? You've got to meet Uhura. And she was such a lovely, lovely presence there. She's, she was sitting down because she was already, you know, getting quite a bit older at that point. And, you know, sitting there looking just like, like absolute royalty, you know, just the yeah. way she carried herself was so magnificent. And I walk up and I, and I kind of do the typical photo op thing where I stand like near her, but kind of keeping to myself and, you know, just slightly behind her. She turns around, looks at me, grabs my hand, puts it on her shoulder and like holds it with her hand and then, and then reaches up and holds it with the other hand and just gives the warmest, most beautiful smile. And I've, I'm of course melted at this point. I'm just like, I'm fanning, fan geeking out at this, just like the, the smile on my face. It's so genuine. And the smile on her face just looked so genuine and, and beautiful. It's still one of my most favorite possessions is the photograph of her and I together. She was just so lovely and warm and like, you know, celebrities don't have to do that. Don't have to do that personal thing. But she was like, no, 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 no. Get over here. We're, we're embracing for this photo. You're not going to stand just kind of near me. So lovely. And I was, I was, again, I fell in love with her again at that moment. Yeah. It sounds like this is something she really did enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And even when her health was declining, she was still showing up to conventions and there's controversy as to if she was being forced by certain people to do this or not. But I do believe from what I've heard and seen and, and even her talking at certain events that, you know, she really loves to do the convention. She loves meeting people. And the last time I saw her was at the last Star Trek Las Vegas I was at, I guess, I mean, what, about three years ago or whatever it was. And I was with, I was walking around the floor with Amy Nelson, who's on several Star Trek podcasts <laughs> and, uh, we're walking around and there's Nichelle sitting at her table and nobody else is around. It was the crowd had died down around that area. And she's just sitting there. And I don't remember. She was like moving some papers around or doing something. And Amy stops me. She just grabs me and she goes, look at her. Just look at her. Can you believe it? There she is. Look, just, you know, take her in right now. You know how incredible it is to see this fantastic woman sitting there. Like you said, like royalty or whatever. And she didn't notice that, you know, Nichelle didn't even notice this. Day. And I'm like, yeah, I see her. And she goes, yeah, but just take it in. And mm. I'm thinking, well, this may be the last time I see her, which it actually was. But then I started to feel weird. I'm like, we're staring at her. <laughs> and she looks up and kind of smiles. And I'm like, okay, let's move on. I feel a little weird just staring at her. <laughs> like, you know, but, but yeah, that was the last time I saw her. 
Wow. Yeah. Amazing, amazing woman. And I, I, I think the folks listening can hear the genuine affection in our voices and, and can understand the huge loss, of course, to the Star Trek community, uh, losing Nichelle Nichols like this. I did want to mention one other thing, not necessarily a Nichelle Nichols Uhura moment, but just a, uh, a little tribute that recent Star Trek did to Uhura. And that was uh, some of the background information in Star Trek Picard season two that revealed that Uhura eventually made the rank of captain and was captain of the USS Leo de Grants. And uh, it turned out to be a ship that Picard served on as an ensign, I believe it said, or something like that. And uh, so it's canon that Picard served under Captain Uhura. And that's pretty darn cool, I think. A nice little tribute. Again, not specifically Nichelle Nichols, but you know they were thinking of the original Uhura, Nichelle Nichols, when they created that uh, little piece of background set decoration. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, um, this was fun talking about her. Yeah, you know, she she will be missed, but we still have her forever on all these episodes and movies. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> she'll live on in our memories. What's 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 the what's the line in Star Trek three where Bones is talking about Spock and we can kind of paraphrase it to refer to Uhura. She's not really gone, you know, as long as we remember her. So uh, let's talk about the announcement that we teased at the beginning of the show yes so changes or or something coming up for positively trek hmm. yes who wants to tell everybody <laughs> <laughs> you know you're not really gone as long as you remember <laughs> that's appropriate <laughs> Because uh, I'll go ahead and say, so I am leaving the show. I'm leaving Positively Trek. My heart is always with it, but I won't be here on the episodes uh, much longer. I, I say it that way because I think I'll be on for another one or two episodes or so. So this isn't necessarily my last episode unless something happens. <laughs> but um, just I, I don't want to get too far into it. Uh, so nothing's wrong. You know, it's nothing like health reasons or anything like that. It's just, um, I'm just moving on into different things in my life. My career has gotten, or my job has just gotten more demanding. Um, it's not a bad thing, but I have a more prominent role in the company. Uh, it takes a lot more time and it, it wears me out <laughs> sometimes. Mm -hmm. But And it takes a lot of work to do a podcast. And I've been podcasting since 2015, so it's been 17 years. Not 17, seven <laughs> years. <laughs> Feels like 17 years, but it's only been seven. And uh, I'm just going to – I've also decided to pursue some other things that I've used to do. And one of those is stand-up comedy. And we'll see how that pans out. <clears throat> yeah, we'll see how that works. But anyway, um, I just – because of time demands and other things, and I won't bore you with, it was just a combination of things that it was just, it felt like it was the right time. And it's not just leaving the show. It's just, you know, just leaving podcasting in general and just going and doing other things. And I don't know, maybe I'll get in, back into podcasting someday. I may just need this break. I don't know. Or maybe I'll make occasional appearances on this show or other shows every once in a while. I don't know yet. But right now, yeah, I'm taking my leave of the show right now and my my sad leave of Dan. I don't want to make him cry <laughs> or to make me cry. But I've always enjoyed, Dan, talking to you about Star Trek. I have never had anybody as close of a Star Trek fan as I've had in you. And that started on Literary Tracks. And I was reading your book reviews even before Literary Tracks, so I knew who you were. <laughs> But going on literary tracks, and I was worried at the time because Matt Rushing was planning to leave and I was coming in. And I said to Matt, I was like, I, you know, I don't know. What if Dan doesn't like me or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it all worked out. And then we decided to spin things off and get more into Star Trek into this podcast instead of just doing books. But books, of course, are very important to us. So, yeah, it's been two and a half years and 200 
I think we're, we're at 212 now episodes. I mean, it's a good run, you know? So, but you know, that's to say real quick, the show's not over. That's absolutely. I want to just say that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, obviously going to miss you a, a huge amount. And, and like you say, you'll be around for, for the next couple episodes at least. And uh, the last uh, well, two plus years, I guess we started in March of 2020 and then plus the years before that doing literary treks have just been uh, some of the most fun I've had engaging with the Star Trek fandom has been doing this podcast with you. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's going to be tough and there will be changes to the podcast going forward. And and like you said, definitely not at an end. There are plans afoot. Things keep marching on. We'll, we'll keep getting this podcast out more to come on that more announcements in the future as to what the fu- the future of this podcast will look like, but it will continue. That said, no one could replace you, Bruce. Uh, you know, there, there will be other hosts, of positively trek in the future perhaps even me someday will be replaced by someone else this might be a totally different show i may you know whatever but uh nothing will ever replace these last 200 plus episodes uh that we've done together and the the joy that i have personally had doing this show with you um it's it's hard to imagine doing it without you but uh Ah, man, I'm going to miss you. I'm, and I am going to cry now. So, ooh, okay. <laughs> Whew, boy. Um, but yeah, no, rest assured, everyone, this is not the end. This is, uh, this is a new beginning. It'll be different, but it will still be positively Trek. And Bruce, you will be very, very much missed, I'm sure, not just by me, but by all of our listeners. Well, I thank you for that. And I will miss the listeners and all the people I've met through this show and through the other shows and at conventions. And yeah, I'm still going to be around, you know, I'll, you know, maybe in Seattle next year for that convention. And yeah, in just a couple of weeks, I'll be at dragon con in Atlanta, just maybe just for a day, but yeah, it's been, it's been great to just learn more about star Trek and learn about the enthusiasm that so many people have for this franchise. And it's like, I, I knew when I fell in love with Star Trek, I knew I wasn't the only one like this. I knew there was a whole community. I knew I wasn't unique in it. And I never thought I'd ever really participate in the fan community in any way. But this gave me a chance to do that. And it was very eye-opening to the different ideas and things that people say and just how generally nice Star Trek fans are. I mean, they're just mm-hmm. a great group of people. And that that's that's a big takeaway for me. And I think that's reflective in the name of this podcast. Yeah. And and whoever fills the seat I'm sitting in now or or whatever happens, you know, with the show in the future. And yeah, we're discussing plans. I mean, it's that that enthusiasm will continue. These discussions will continue and they may be better discussions than I can bring to the table. It it doesn't matter. You know, it just will be good stuff and uh, I'll be listening. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, call me biased, but you say that Star Trek fans are amazing and wonderful. And I think that's absolutely true. But I would say that the listeners of this podcast are the cream of the crop when it comes to Star Trek fans. So uh, that's not just me pandering. It's a little bit me pandering, but it's also Mm -hmm. I I feel very genuinely um, sincere about that, given the discussions that happen in our Facebook group and the feedback we get from the people who listen. Really wonderful group of fans. And Bruce, to you, I want to say the door is always open. Um, you're always welcome to to join us to to guest on the show or that that is always going to be a reserved spot for you. Yes, thank you. And I'll miss talking to the authors and our guests. I've always enjoyed that. I, I maybe not miss David Max so much, but the other authors, <laughs> yeah, I would have <laughs> no, just kidding. Oh, uh, I had to pick one. I thought David could handle the sarcasm the best. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, Dayton's drunk in the green room, so he's passed out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm genuinely going to miss these discussions, though. So 
Godspeed and uh, second star to the right and straight on till morning and all those great uh, Star Trek send offs. But again, not still more to come with you, too. So we're not we're not losing you quite yet. No, not quite yet. Just maybe another couple episodes. But I will say that I'm hoping to do I, I do want to come back at least sometime later just to see if you'll say, and with me, as he always is, at the beginning of an episode. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm going to have to figure out exactly how to open the episodes now. Um, <laughs> hmm, yeah. <laughs> oh, but the last thing I'll say, oh, I'll still be watching all the new Star Trek. <laughs> that, Excellent. This has nothing to do with me like, oh, I don't ride into Star Trek anymore. Not at all. My love for Star Trek is as big, if not bigger, so... Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, Brandy and I do the live show um, every Saturday when there's new episodes coming out. And, you know, you've been known to drop in on that every once in a while. So you you never know. That's a possibility, too. Yes. (laughs) So anyway, so when I'm not doing positively track, I can be found on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. That's Admiral with the underline Rex. And uh, always in the discussion group. But Dan, when I'm not here, where can people find you? You can always find me on Twitter at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. And of course, in the Positively Trek discussion group, where I hope Bruce won't be a stranger there as well. Great discussions happening about Star Trek all the time there. Just uh, answer a few questions click that you agree to the group rules and we will let you right in. And uh, of course, patreon.com slash positively Trek. If you want to help out the show, we really do appreciate each and every one of our listeners. And of course, especially our Patreon supporters. Thank you for making these episodes possible. We could not do it without you. And you can follow us on Twitter at positively track. So if you want to know what's happening with the show, it'll be tweeted there. <laughs> so, and, uh, and we mentioned about Facebook. And of course I always want to mention Goodreads. That's where we post the upcoming books that we're going to do here on the book club. And I'm hoping that continues. I hadn't thought about that. I just yes. realized I'm going to have to get real uh, busy on Goodreads now because I've been counting on you to carry that. <laughs> oh, that's right. Mm, yeah. Well, I can help you out a little there if I have to. to. So, uh, yeah. So I want to thank our patrons for supporting our show. It means a lot to us and it really does help with the cost to keep the show going. And then also want to thank all the listeners to, for listening to positively Trek and supporting us along the way. So, so this isn't the last time I'm going to say this, but it's going to be one of the last times they say this and it is to stay positive.